begin with wishing everyone very happy in the life day. In 2021, we initiated the masterclass with an intention of encouraging a conversation on business archives and its role in the corporate setting. In this fast changing world, it is the heritage that ensures continuity. And it is the legacy of our founders that provides us the necessary strength to move forward with an informed mind. We believe that history is not just a nostalgia, but a knowledge that has much more to offer to the future generation. Through our master classes, we intend to explore the role of history as learning tool or a strategic tool to map or analyze the future developments and trends. We thank our previous speakers, Anders Woman and Chris Huaz, for enlightening our audience about the value that corporate archives can add to the businesses. And we are grateful to Tina Staples, our present speaker, for accepting our invite to deliver our third masterclass. Welcome, Tina, and welcome you all to the third masterclass. Mrs. Nairika Holkar, Executive Director of Godridge and Boys, could not be present today, but she has sent a message for us. We'll be just sharing a short clip. A very good evening to you all. Today on International Archives Day, we have a special guest, Tina Staples, who will share her reflections on the importance of archives in creating a living history. The Godridge Archives has evolved over time and we take inspiration from archives across the world that have stood the test of time and create a strong linkage to the past paving the way for the future. Archives within a company are crucial in preserving its history and institutional knowledge. The past serves as a guiding tool for the future, inspiring the generations to come. Archives can also serve as a knowledge center, continuously identifying even current data that can be useful as a resource in the future and can proactively preserve current records as well as ensuring that archives remain accessible in the future. Such masterclasses can inspire the archives and also the company to face the future challenges by smartly adapting changing technologies while maintaining its essence. On International Archives Day, we all wish that more organizations recognize the role played by the archives in remembering history and in shaping the future leadership to equip them with knowledge that could help them steer the organization in the right direction towards a promising future. Happy International Archives Day. Thank you, Nairika, for that message. We are happy to have amongst us Harpreet Kaur, Senior Vice President and Head, Personnel and Administration at Gotrish and Boys. Harpreet and the entire PNA team has always been the constant support, encouraging the archives all along the 17 years of our archival journey. I would now request Harpreet to address the call gathering. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, you know, special thanks to uh, Rinda and the entire archives team. So to have invited me on uh, such a you know in nice occasion of the International Archives Day, uh, especially because I think when Rinda mentions that we've completed 17 years in Godridge for the archives, I think it's a very uh, good progress we have been able to do over the last 17 years. And of course, when we look back, we definitely see it with a lot of matter of pride and we cherish what we've been able to bring it to the world. And of course, I must invite uh, Ms. Tina Staples, who is going to help all of us learn some new perspectives on how archives um, and the history documentation and contribution can really help uh, all of us as employees as well as as citizens of the country and of the global world because there is so much interdependence to learn from businesses as they progress uh, and i think uh, there's a lot of silent contribution which is being done in terms of documenting parallelly as the business progresses there's so much to learn from the past at the same time there's so much interdependent world we all live in uh, that 
what happens in a particular context in a particular country has so much of connections today in the global uh, context and i think the biggest lesson i think most corporates learned were also through the pandemic period in terms of understanding the global interdependence and uh, you know archives um, you know really helps us to look back in the past and to see how the learnings happened what went right what uh, got managed in which manner and there's a much wider network uh, which uh, you know depends on all what is being documented through archives so uh, we should uh, you know see it as a far more connected world and if we see it in the, as a connected world there's a lot of learning which employees the members who are interested to learn from history referencing uh, people who are interested in research uh, people who are just interested to understand what happened to brands, what happened to specific decisions for the brands. There's so much of masterclasses, even in terms of learning, uh, you know, of specific decisions on commodities, on pricing, on dollar dependence, and so many other aspects, which is very fascinating to see, you know, um, uh, from the archival lens is the value add, which is being created for the future of the companies and uh, the economics overall has lost of interdependence as well so i would put it uh, in such a way that uh, you know the session which we probably will uh, bring to the light today is how uh, you know maybe maybe uh, and i would give the credit probably pandemic brought it at a far more enlightened manner the dependence or the need uh, you know which the future will bring from the perspective of digital and technology and it will really help uh, us to connect with a much larger world uh, which all of us will experience in the coming years uh, because it's it's already a reality and it's only going to enhance more and more so while the love for um, uh, you know physical there's equally a love for digital and you know both uh, are very much uh, making each other complete is the way i would put it rather than saying one is more important or one is less important and uh, i would say that i think all of us at goatrey deeply pride in what we've been able to bring up so far and are equally passionate about how we will take the journey forward so all of the enthusiasts who are part of the session today and those who will probably you know experience the session later i would put it in such a way that i think all of us are creating history every day and if we are conscious of that i think we'll really uh, enjoy the journey of creating history as we progress from one day to the next day. All the best and uh, Vrinda, keep uh, doing good job and uh, welcoming Tina Staples, whereby we can all learn some other perspectives which will help all of us in the uh, process of archiving. Thank you. Thank you, Harpreet, for uh, wishing us and also thank you for the insights that you have just shared. And in fact, when you spoke about, you know, uh, you know, when we are actually preserving the physical, we also need to preserve and, you know, really plan for uh, archiving the digital and the bond digital records. And, you know, and I'm really glad that, you know, Tina is amongst us today because, uh, you know, when uh, I had heard Tina for the first time at one of the conference of section on business archives of International Council on Archives in Milan in 2015. Uh, I was really amazed to hear about the digital archiving systems that HSBC had put in place and the kind of efforts that you know HSBC is uh, investing in uh, to actually have you know uh, preserving all the current digital data that is being created within an organization across the globe and. Uh, so uh, and before introducing actually Tina, I would like to request everyone, uh, you know, to feel free to post tweet about this event on the social media as it happens and do not forget to tag Godrej Archives. So thank you. So Tina Staples is a global head of archives at HSBC. She qualified as an archivist in 1999 and initially spent a year at the Victoria and Albert Museum as the archivist for the Arts Council of Great Britain. In 2000, she joined the HSBC archives team in London, taking over the responsibility for the department in 2007. Tina now manages a team across London, Hong Kong, Paris and New York with the collection meeting high demand from internal and external stakeholders around the globe. So over to you, Tina. We are just waiting to get enlightened.
Thank you so much, Runda, and um, for all the lovely introductions. It's a real honour to mark International Archives Day with you all today. Um, let me share my screen. I am going to be talking today about global reach in a hybrid working world uh, and giving you the HSBC archives experience. Uh, so as you've just heard, I'm the global head of archives at HSBC. It's one of the world's largest banking and financial organisations in the world. And I manage a fabulous team of 16 people across four different locations. Uh, so Hong Kong, London, New York and Paris. And here are some images of them at work across the different continents. As you've heard, I joined the bank all the way back in 2000 and I took over as head of the team in 2007. And it's kind of crazy actually to think about how much time has passed since then. Um, I imagine many of you are now wondering why on earth I'm still here or why haven't I moved on to somewhere else by now? Well, the answer to that question is that the job title may not have changed, but the scope of the role has transformed significantly over the years. Every year there's new fresh challenges, fresh opportunities. There's a huge variety of demands and lots of responsibilities. And of course, the global nature of the role is very exciting too. One outcome of my long tenure is obviously a, a very long term perspective. And I think that's a real advantage to HSBC archives. So I know firsthand that it's necessary to have a robust vision and um, plans in place to preserve the corporate memory, a you know, strong vision and plans. But it's also really important to be able to flex that vision and change those plans, adapt them to the developing needs of the organisation. Because of course I've seen resources come, I've seen resources go, I've seen business strategies going one direction and then suddenly they're overtaken by events and they go off in another direction. And of course you'll know some corporate trends, new trends become policy and become established whereas others just fizzle out completely. So any archives department really has to be seen to be staying relevant in this very fast paced environment. So today I'm hoping to share with you some of the ways in which we at HSBC have adapted how we're ensuring the archives are continuing to add value to the organisation. And I feel we're currently finding our feet in something of a new era, a new epoch, as alluded to in the introductions. The corporate world and the world in general is embracing much more advanced technology. There's so much discussion now around artificial intelligence and chat box the metaverse, NFTs, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology, and all those other elements driving Web3 and the potential there is for such an immersive digital experience now. I certainly wouldn't begin to describe myself as a tech expert, but even in my archives role, I feel I have one foot now in the present and one foot in the future on this. And similarly, I'm a big advocate for hybrid working. So I love having some of the week in the office, interacting in person with colleagues and customers of the archive service. Plus, of course, being able to handle the physical archives collection. The reason everybody gets into archives is a profession. But the rest of the week, I'm logged in remotely via my virtual private network, my VPN. I'm still interacting very effectively with customers and clients and colleagues. And thanks to our work on digital archives at HSBC, I'm still able to access a huge part of the archives collection. The added advantage is, of course, that um, I can now connect with anyone anywhere around the globe from the comfort of my own home or even on the go. So it has that global reach. 20 years ago, I would have definitely struggled to envisage an archivist working remotely for so much of the week. It just didn't seem feasible that you could work from, removed from the physical archives collection. It was such a hands on role in those days. And here's where I see some overlaps with all that potential new te technology now. We're one foot in the physical, one foot in the virtual, but the lines are really starting to blur. And how are we as business archivists going to embrace that change? So this is where I'm taking the talk today. How is HSBC Archives using technology to open up a world of opportunity? 
I'm going to begin in a very traditional way, though, with a little brief introduction to HSBC's history, because that, of course, provides the main backdrop to all that we do in the archive service. I will then go on to look at how our service has evolved over the last decade or so, and we'll explore some of the value adding outputs such as social media and our public website. And then I'd like to focus in on the back end of our operations, our global digital archive system and the collection management processes that go with it. These are the fundamental building blocks built on professional archives management training that make everything else possible. So as I said, let's start in a traditional way with a little mini history of HSBC. We started out in 1865 with a very clear and simple aim to establish a bank in Hong Kong and Shanghai for the support of local and international trade. So our first office opened in Hong Kong on the 3rd of March 1865. We had a very um, international outlook from the beginning. So the bank was British, it was owned and managed, um, set up by Brits, but we actually had a special ordinance from Queen Victoria to be locally headquartered in Hong Kong. The first board included Brits, of course, but there were also a couple of Indian gentlemen merchants. There was an American, a German, a Norwegian. So you get the impression it was, you know, very global in outlook from the beginning. And it was all about supporting international trade within Hong Kong. This lovely image is from a, a couple of decades later. You can see our office, the second building on the left there on the waterfront. Um, we'd initially just opened up, um, rented a couple of offices in Wardley House. It was just a startup business. Nobody knew how it would go, how successful it would be. Um, we did get off to a good start, so we were able to build, uh, to buy the building outright. And then we knocked that down for this lovely purpose built head office in the 1880s. Uh, that we then rebuilt again on the site in the 1930s and again in the 1980s, which is the head office in Hong Kong today. We've actually been on that same site though, one Queens Road Central, the same address. If anyone's familiar with the landscape of Hong Kong Island today, you'll know we're a long way from the waterfront where there's been so much land reclaimed in the harbour. But actually we've been at that same address on that same spot, one Queens Road Central. So it really is our, our spiritual home. We opened, of course, the name the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. We opened in Shanghai a month later, and we also opened an, of an office in London in July of that year. And then in 1866, we expanded to Japan, Yokohama. 1867, we opened in Kolkata in India. And from there, we started spreading around Asia. Trade finance was our bread and butter. So basically where you found a, a port in Asia that had lots of goods coming in, going out, international trade, that's where HSBC was setting up offices very strategically in the same way we have a very strategic footprint today. We also opened offices in Hamburg in Germany, which had a strong links round to Asia and in Lyon in France. So not Paris, we picked Lyon because it was the heart of the silk trade in Europe. And of course, we had our customers in China and Japan looking to trade and we had the importers there in Lyon. So it made sense to have a branch there. We also opened in San Francisco in New York in 1875, 1880. So by 1900, we had 27 offices in 16 countries across Asia, Europe and America. This lovely image, by the way, we think is probably about 1890s and is uh, the Hong Kong Bank staff in, in Bombay, Mumbai. Then into the 20th century, so lots of challenges, of course, as with all businesses, the First World War, the Wall Street crash, Great Depression, the tension between Japan and China in the 1930s leading into the Second World War. So HSBC, we, we came through it all. We built up a reputation for resilience. Um, the bank was very good at forward planning and also building up its reserves. So every year we were putting money aside, those pennies for a rainy day, which really came to the fore, particularly during the Second World War. Um, I've included this image. This is one of our lion, Stephen. Some of you may be familiar. We have two lion statues outside many of our head offices. They're very symbolic to HSBC, Stephen and Stitt. This is Stephen and it's actually their birthday. It's their centenary this year. They're 100 years old. The first pair of lions were commissioned for our lovely new rebuilt office in Shanghai in 1923. Post-war was a period of recovery and um, particularly for transformation really of Hong Kong. So there were lots of families arriving in Hong Kong from mainland China and um, 
the Hong Kong really transformed from being very much a trading hub into a manufacturing centre. So HSBC was opening extra branches to help accommodate this, to support the factories that were being built up in, in Kowloon and lots of the other tiger economies, of course, across Asia in the, the later part of the 20th century. Uh, we celebrated our centenary um, and then moving forward into the sort of 70s, 80s. Well, in fact, back in 1959, we'd acquired the British Bank of the Middle East which is now HSBC Bank Middle East, and the Mercantile Bank of India, which was a, a large and very well-run big bank in India that was subsumed into HSBC and we really expanded our footprint in India through that oh, acquisition. Yeah, so we then um, continued um, with the acquisitions in the, the 1980s. In the 1980s particularly, we had um, a big acquisition of Marine Midland in New York State. Um, and then the transformative deal of um, buying Midland Bank in the UK in 1992. By now, the HSBC group was getting so big, um, the parent company, HSBC Holdings PLC, was established. And it was established in the UK. And so London, um, that's why we have the global headquarters in London, because of holdings being set up there. But the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank Banking Corporation as an entity is still there in Hong Kong. You can see the lovely building there from the 1980s, now completely dwarfed by some of the, the big, biggest skyscrapers that have taken, taken over the skyline there, but still our iconic head office on the, on the waterfront. The acquisitions continued into the 1990s and the 2000s, a real period of growth for HSBC. We've actually shrunk back slightly from those days. Um, uh, There's sort of a big over restructure and looking at the footprint and where we needed to be. But still, our, our strategy remains firmly rooted in our heritage. So identifying where the growth is and finding opening up opportunities for our customers. As I said, that was a real whiz through the history. Um, just to set the scene as to the content, the stories, the material we have to work with in the archives department. So we'll move on to talk about activating the archives. And I'm starting off with a very predictable slide coming from an archivist. It's a bit of a timeline. And you'll see that I've noted various milestones in the development of HSBC's archives over the years. And I'm not expecting anyone to read this in great detail. We'll just pick out a few of the, the key points. So firstly, the core of the collection was developed in the 1980s. This is when the records of Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation really came to be centralised and catalogued. And it was thanks to the bank's chairman commissioning a history book. Um, in fact, that history book turned into a four volume corporate publication by Professor Frank King. Um, it was widely noted um, for its rigorous use of primary source material when business archive collections certainly weren't that well established and um, certainly not always accessible to historians. So um, a, a major milestone there. We had another book project to mark our 150th anniversary and this kick-started the next major collecting programme. And here the archivists were extremely proactive. We actually approached senior management with a proposal in 2005, a full 10 years before the anniversary. We knew that the book wanted to focus on the modern period of the bank and we knew that we needed time to identify, to collect and then to catalogue significant deposits of recent records. And particularly we were um, very aware that we were going to be collecting in the new millennium and it's going to involve less paper and more digital records and that was going to be quite groundbreaking and we needed time to plan and prepare for that. A quick bit of background because I will be talking about digital records, born digital, physical. At HSBC Archives we operate in terms of physical records, digital copies and born digital records. So when I'm talking about physical records, it's anything that you can handle manually. So from paper documents to ledgers, printed photographs, or history cassettes, beta cam films, banknotes, artifacts, etc. Digital copies are digital versions of an original physical record. Um, these are usually created by the archivists for access purposes. So for example, an archivist scanning a photograph to use on social media. And then we have born digital records as well, which were created, stored and used during their active lifetime in their digital format. 
and then they're transferred to the archives digitally and we continue to preserve them in digital format. So examples include Microsoft Office um, documents, it could be an email, a PDF, a JPEG or a whole website. Quickly back to the timeline, you'll see our Global Digital Archive System was in place and winning an award in 2016. We'll come back to that later. And you'll also see our history website launched in 2000, uh, sorry, 2021. And that's another key milestone that I'm going to come back to. So when I think back to my first decade with HSBC, I'm reminded how lucky I was to join such a well-established corporate archive. You saw from the timeline that the collections had started years earlier. And at the start of the new millennium, the small team, and it was small, it was just three archivists in those days, was headed by Edwin Green, one of the first professionally employed business archive, archivists in the UK. So Midland Bank had recruited him in 1974, and he had, and he still has in retirement, a really first class reputation in the archive sector. The team were widely known as in the bank as a golden source of knowledge about HSBC's history and corporate culture. And they had a really strong rec record of delivering many of the, what you might call the traditional outputs of an archive service at the start of the 21st century. So I've given some examples here. They were producing lots of history brochures and corporate publications. They were running inquiry services and supporting academic research. There were pop-up traveling exhibitions, you know, the kinds that you had in a cassette with the little banner that you've sort of put the pole in the back to pop it up and that might be somewhere sent out for a branch anniversary somewhere. And then traditional display cabinets and head office and so on. So this really solid track record um, built up and it built up two things that I've um, marked out as key enablers that have helped us to take that work to the next level. So firstly, over the years, all these services, all these outputs helped to build up a really extraordinary breadth and depth of knowledge amongst the archivists. And this included knowledge of the bank's history itself, but also the vast archive collections across the four different locations. That's not to say that at times we probably could have strengthened our knowledge management procedures to protect and pass on that wisdom. And there's always some facts and insights that are locked away in archivists' brains that you really need to get extracted into a system somewhere to pass on to the next generation. But nevertheless, this incredible subject matter expertise built up over time and offered a real launch pad to take things to the next level and to go for some really ambitious targets. Secondly, I would point out um, the senior manager's appreciation for the archive service. Their support was really important. Observers have remarked that the corporate culture of HSBC is strong and distinct and pride in the bank's history and traditions is part of that. Now, in recent times, it's actually been much more, much quicker turnover at the top level. So lots of new faces and fresh ideas. And the heritage acts as something like a bonding glue, I think, holding the bank together helping to make sense of our purpose in the world today and with all that there are high expectations that the archives team can utilize the collection can articulate the heritage and can make it really come to life today so speaking as an archivist i am always mindful that we've worked on some very well resourced projects over the years but these resources always come with high expectation that we are going to deliver a strong return on investment and it's certainly not the case that we've sat back passively waiting for senior managers to find us and, and to appreciate the heritage. Over the years, we've been very proactive in raising our profile and helping our executives to understand the strategic value of our, of our heritage assets. So let's move on to look at some projects where we've taken things to what I would describe as the next level. And there was one real standout project, I would say, in the early 2000s. That was the HSBC History Wall. A new global headquarters was being built in London at the turn of the century, and it included a vast reception hall. So how could we use the archives in this space to illustrate the bank's heritage and traditions? And it was a particularly pertinent moment. The HSBC group was un undergoing incredible growth at the moment, um, inquiring businesses around the globe, as I mentioned. 
At one point, the bank was employing more than 300,000 people across more than 80 countries, incredibly large. And I mentioned before the idea of the company heritage acting as a bonding clue, a glue. And you can see here how it was helpful to reinforce the values and the purpose of the founding organization, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, to guide the merged banks as they integrated into the organization. So the history wall was unveiled in September 2002. It consists of 3,743 individual images that tell the story of the bank's development. And we collaborated on the project with um, an exciting young designer just breaking onto the art scene, Thomas Heatherwick. If you look closely at the photograph, you'll see on the left hand side some touch screens. So the wall was originally conceived as a physical installation, but as we were building it, a request came through from the group CEO. He wanted us to recreate the wall on touchscreen so that visitors could explore it, so they could zoom into images, they could scan up and down, read captions and so on. So um, we started working with a software company on a bespoke app to deliver just that. And it was actually very innovative at the time. This kind of technology had been growing popular in museums around the world, global museums. Um, during the 1990s, but it certainly wasn't commonplace in business archive settings. Um, so it was very exciting, although I do recall that the, um, the hardware wasn't terribly robust at the time. I had to keep popping down from level 36 in the lift to uh, restart and recalibrate those touch screens. Um, but as I say, it was very early days for that kind of technology. Over the next decade, the archivists delivered successful projects on many fronts. And I think we proved our worth. I was able to justify additional resource and the team more than doubled in size over that period. There was no sitting back and resting on our laurels. As our reputation increased, certainly internal demand from the business grew. And then came what I would say was our biggest opportunity to shine. The bank's 150th anniversary in 2015. So a corporate anniversary is often the catalyst to initiate a new archive service in a business or to invest, to increase investment in an existing service. And we were certainly very fortunate in that respect. So budget was found to redevelop our Hong Kong archive facilities. We worked with designers Winkle Picker and a new repository was built with a wonderful gallery space. Essentially, it was a, a mini music. It is a mini museum with physical exhibits, plus a host of digital stations, interactive stations to provide real wow moments as visitors move through the space and learn about the HSBC story. So on the slide here, you can see guests enjoying an object recognition table where they can take a 3D model of a head office building, put it on the tabletop and then relevant archive assets will spring into life and they can have a play and read and move them around. There's a huge touchscreen timeline in the space. There's also screens to zoom it, zoom into minute minutiae these sort of details of the physical exhibits and you know really get into get to grips with the physical exhibits and find out more information. There's also a virtual reality vault where users can select and take things off the shelves in the archives of London, uh, New York and Paris whilst they're standing there in the space in Hong Kong. So really exciting times and the centre remains very popular. We have thousands of visitors every year and that includes employees and clients and the wider public. You can see some school children there enjoying the space. Now at the same time as developing the Hong Kong Archive Centre, we were hard at work collaborating with colleagues in brand sponsorship and communications on a catalogue of other anniversary projects. So one of the best, I think, one of the most eye-catching was helping to do develop an animation of our history, which was beamed onto our Hong Kong head office by a huge sort of LED lights for an amazing light show that ran for many weeks. And here's a little taster of that for you.
just a little taster. <clears throat> um, you saw a few slides earlier, a 150th anniversary banknote. Um, that design was inspired by the archives and we contributed to an accompanying app that incorporated augmented reality to allow users to explore the design in detail. There were dinners in various cities around the world um, that included audiovisual experience, in one case interpretive modern dance, which was quite exciting. There was a series of documentary films that um, leaned very heavily on our storytelling abilities and actually featured some of our archivists. And these were available on the bank's internal TV channel and over YouTube, and they enjoyed over a million views, which was great. There was the new history book that I mentioned before, The Lion Wakes came out 10 years in the making. We contributed to a co-sponsored exhibition at the Hong Kong Maritime Museum. There were sculptures, there were heritage talks, tours and lots more, so a really exciting year. The investment was obviously significant, but the level of expectation on our shoulders was also equally huge. We used the archives more extensively and more creatively than ever before. Our storytelling skills combined with the latest technology and that delivered real impact. And the feedback was fabulous and I'm really, really proud of all that we achieved together as a team that year. So what Oops. <clears throat> Going on to greater global reach. I would say that one important takeaway from that exciting and very exhausting year um, was definitely the excellent feedback and the impact analysis. So that was both quantitative and qualitative, and it enabled us to demonstrate the scope of appetite for the bank's heritage. Our communications team now naturally came to us for stories and for material. And um, nostalgia was referenced in the introductions. We all know that nostalgia um, draws a crowd, but I believe it goes lots, a lot further than that. At HSBC, we know that our archives content isn't mere nostalgia, it's tangible evidence that brings our, to life our purpose, our strategy, our values and our brand and it really provides the foundation on what on our foundations to our reputation in the world today. So we in the archives team supplied some lovely content to um, the bank's social media platforms in the years following 2015. And this was a time when channels such as Twitter, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn became really commonplace communications tools. And all that work was really well received. There was lots of um, positive interaction with the brand. So the net, natural next step, certainly in our eyes, was a public facing, a full public facing history website. HSBC.com is the bank's main website and that already hosted some content for us. So we had on there lovely timeline, images and information about the archive service. But we could see an opportunity to take this to the next level. A specific site dedicated to sharing the bank's heritage and getting as much value as possible out of the archival assets. However, Whilst the 150th anniversary was something of a, a fixed, immutable milestone that you could say we were really duty bound to commemorate, there was no such obligation for a history website. We could point to the fact that many other businesses had um, fantastic history content on the internet. Um, and we were actually probably behind the curve on this front at that time. But that in itself is not a justification. Um, so we had to build a really robust business, ca business case, set out the costs and really argue for the benefits of the project. On this slide, I've included some extracts from our documentation at the time to give a flavour of how we envisaged the website working and how we were trying to put forward that winning business case. You'll see that we reference remote and sustainable um, access. We talk about emerging technologies and multi-dimensional -dim display. And we point out that storytelling isn't just for fun, it's going to be building credibility and adding value to the brand. And happily, after some back and forth with senior management, we did get the go ahead. So cue many more months of hard work. And um, the site was developed with Fender Townsweb and launched in 2021. Um, the world, of course, was still firmly in the grip of the COVID pandemic at this point, and the significance of the timing wasn't lost on us. 
at the very time that our doors were shut physically, we couldn't um, run our tours and talks in person as usual. Here was the perfect alternative, a remote way into the archives served up to a truly global audience. And the website could accommodate far more guests in a month than we could possibly hope to cater for in the physical world. The guests could deep uh, dive deeper into the collection. They could search and explore far more than we can cover in a traditional tour around the centres. And they can even make return visits when we've uploaded new content just at the click of a button. So on the site, you'll find lots of, um, again, great use of technology. So virtual tours, virtual reality tours of our archive centres in London and Hong Kong, similar to the wonderful virtual tour offered on the Godrej archive site, of course. Users can explore digital copies of the records from the collection via keyword and advanced search facilities. They can discover themed snapshots curated through artifacts and audio visual assets. <clears throat> there are immersive exhibitions full of imagery, stories and quotes, and some assets are available with 360 degree viewing. And I'm pleased to say the user statistics have been really pleasing. Um, in October last year, for example, we launched an exhibition all about our Hexagon logo. And there was lots of publicity around this when it launched. Um, and we recorded over 3,400 unique visitors to the site that month from 99 countries around the globe. So real global reach. And importantly, we're also holding the attention of our visitors. So dwell time spent looking at the exhibition content is consistently above six minutes. Doesn't sound all that long, but actually that's a considerable chunk of time in terms of website viewing. Of course, the website is under constant development. We're regularly updating digital copies and adding curated content on specific themes. Our, con <clears throat> our content runway aims to support the wider bank strategy and announcements. So we've explored the history of women working in the bank, for example, to contribute to dialogue around diversity and inclusion. There was recently news about a new headquarters project in New York City, um, so that immediately prompted us to pull together a collection of special assets that could tell our story in the city since 1880. We're always striving to keep the site as relevant as possible to the organisation today. And as we thought would be the case, the website content also acts as a generator of social media content. So, for example, HSBC recently marked um, 75 years in the UAE. Now, prior to the website, we would, of course, been able to provide some images and tell some stories to contribute to a tweet or a LinkedIn story. But now our deep dive exhibition on the anniversary in U the UAE provides our communication colleagues with inspiration on how to pitch the social media coverage that they're putting together. And that social post can then link back to the exhibition on the website for users who want to find out more. So this is a great win-win scenario. Our colleagues have social media platforms that need content, engaging content, and we want to drive traffic to our website. So we're working together. One other point to note is that we are excellent at recycling. So our website content isn't always developed from scratch. Sometimes we might take an existing article or elements from a previous display and repackage those, those contents into website and material. Equally, we can use content that goes onto the website to generate or support other outreach opportunities. So the work that goes into producing a snapshot on Shanghai in the 1920s, for example, can be expanded into an article to go into the bank's pensioner magazine which can be turned into a lunchtime talk, a Zoom talk for employees. And that can be recorded and we can place it onto the internal video sharing platform that we have in the bank. So you get the idea. Basically, we don't like to see anything go to waste. We'll always try and find ways to recycle. <coughs> Our next step is to see whether we can use the technology to make some of the website accessible in specific locations, such as the bank's wealth centres around the world. Perhaps we'd be able to use QR codes to take clients directly into our virtual tours while they're sort of waiting 10, 15 minutes before their appointment to sit down and, and talk about their banking. And perhaps if we can add headsets into the mix, they'll be able to do that journey, have that experience in the metaverse. 
Artificial intelligence and chat box technology is another area that's being talked about and it's looking for content and data to harvest. Now, archives, of course, is a natural source of material. We're sitting on mountains of information, so I think there's very exciting potential there too. We're certainly fortunate that technical innovation is identified as a key pillar of HSBC's strategy. The organisation is looking and does digitise at scale. So naturally, the primary focus is, of course, on digital banking itself, but there's also huge scope for wider customer experiences. And I think we've positioned ourselves really strongly in the organisation to participate in those opportunities. So earlier I mentioned the fact that our global digital archive system is definitely the foundation of all that we do. We started designing a system about a decade ago, working closely with our vendor Preservica, and it launched in 2015. I've put a few notable features on the slide here for you. Um, firstly, it's important to understand it's a very holistic system dealing with both physical and digital. So sometimes we apply a few small adaptions to our collection management procedures when switching between physical and digital, born digital records. But on the whole, we approach them with the same rules and the same philosophy. You can see how the system has grown since launch. We're now up to nearly 150,000 digital files, taking up more than 12 terabytes of space. And we're juggling more than 160 different formats. The chart gives you an overview of how that all breaks down. I should point out that we have no intention of digitizing the collections in their entirety. I'm often asked, um, but that's not the case. Our physical holdings take up more than five linear kilometers of shelving, and I wouldn't like to calculate the time and the resource that would be needed to digitize the entire physical collection. Um, so instead, we take a very um, strategic approach and prioritize material that's worth digitizing. The system and the website as well is managed and strategically developed by dedicated digital archivists on the team. So they are the true experts on the team, the true technical experts. They constantly interface with the vendors and um, with our internal IT teams to keep the show on the road, to keep developing and um, keep, it, keep it relevant and up to date. However, I should stress that all archivists on the team are users of the system. So what you might refer to as a traditional archivist um, in HSBC, they're still fully involved in collecting, in appraising, ingesting and cataloguing born digital records. Um, we're currently undergoing a major upgrade and we're going to be moving the system and the storage to the cloud. Now, just a few years ago, that would have been pretty much unthinkable um, from an IT security management perspective, but um, we've got lots of highly confidential records in the system, as well as the, the public facing records. But things move fast in the IT world and that a cloud environment now has the necessary, necessary security clearance so we can move in that direction. As I've mentioned on the slide, um, APIs are used to push selected content from the very much internal global digital archive system to our public facing history websites. The two systems are linked in that way. We haven't published our catalogues as yet, and this might seem like an obvious next step. Publish the lists, develop a virtual search room where users can order up and ref uh, refer to access all of our digital holdings remotely. But I think this is actually a huge ask. It's perfectly viable from a technical point of view, and as researchers become um, more focused on 21st century records as we get into the, the century, I think they will, they will inevitably be dealing with more and more digital records. There'll be less need for them to travel to an archive centre in person to see physical records. However, we still see the scenario as being some way off. Um, there are huge um, security and compliance hoops to jump through. So we need to be verifying users online, We'd have to sensitivity check all of the records before release. We'd be seeking copyright clearance where there might be um, third party record creators, a big file, which is an HSBC file, but with letters from another company that have um, been filed away in there. We're also facing um, an immense amount of data improvement work to um, enhance and standardize our catalog descriptions across the board to um, make them publicly accessible. 
So there would be lots of work for us as a team. And also, understandably, this is not a strategic business priority within the bank. The target audience would be mainly academic researchers, not employees or clients or the wider public. So putting the business together, putting the business case together will be tough. So at the moment, our priority is on collecting and cataloguing and preserving the records, making sure um, technical obsolescence doesn't become an issue, that we can still access the records we're using forward migration. That's where our focus is on with the system at the moment. I do hope that we will realise that ambition though, one day of a virtual search room in the cloud um, with people being able to access in from wherever they are in the world. So to conclude, um, in the meantime, our history website is obviously opening up our collections more than we've ever managed to achieve before. It undoubtedly has global reach and it's immersive and it's engaging. I've included the QR code here if you'd like to hop on and take a look. And I would say that corporate archives like working patterns are finding ways to be hybrid at the moment. We're blurring the boundaries between the physical and the virtual in really exciting ways. In the last 12 months at HSBC, we've um, supported an NFT project, we've dipped our toes into the bank's metaverse capabilities, and we've been talking about artificial intelligence as well. I don't have a crystal ball to know which of these new technologies are going to sink and which are going to swim, but I'm very confident that HSBC and many other corporate archives, including Godrej, will have the content, the vision and the skill set to make the most of all the opportunities that are offered. And I'd like to thank you so much for listening. I'm